see what happens. With any luck, you should be seeing a presentation out there now with an opening page uh, from me. Um, anybody? Yeah, We've got it, have we? OK, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, probably not that familiar with, with myself. Um, as Ian mentioned, I'm David Hibbert. I'm the Technical Superintendent for Marine Services and Council. Um, I look after the, the ferry fleet, the tug fleet, and the launches, and the, hard, the marine infrastructure around the harbour, and expands walkways, um, lighting, and all, all the boats that uh, go with that. So I've had a, a, a wide interest in, in renewable energy pretty much since I started in this job pretty, in 2004. So we'll, we'll kick off, we'll just have a quick look at uh, what Orkney Ferries does, and just in case anybody's not that familiar with, with the ferry services or the details of it. Uh, you'll notice there's uh, on the screen there, we'll have a, a, a nice map of Orkney. Uh, the group's islands are there, are shown with, you know, the files to the, to the right hand screen, or the, the top right, and, and the other inner islands round about. And there's, and there's a distinction between that. The Outer North Isles require seagoing ships that can actually potentially sail to the, the, Orkney, uh, the Scottish mainland. The Inner Isles have a, a different or inner, inner or sheltered water vessels that uh, are only able to sail between these islands. Uh, there's some statistics on, on the screen for you there, just the number of islands, number of route combinations we have. We have nine vessels of the, of the various types there, operating 20,000 sailings a year. 30 odd thousand passengers, you know, the 55,000 cars and commercial vehicles. So, yeah, to do all that, we don't do it on nothing. Um, we have 145 sea staff to, uh, to, uh, to operate this service, costing about £10 million a year to operate. So, it's, it's a fair chunk of the council's expense just to provide that service. In that, in that £10 million, uh, there is, we require 3 million litres of marine gas oil a year. And we try to plug in our vessels to the shore power just to uh, use some electricity. So we end up using 398,000 uh, megawatt hours of, uh, of shore power every year. So that, that's just a few stats there on 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 the on the ferry services where we are in in the Orkney Islands. A quick look at the, all the ship types I was talking about there. The uh, the screen there showing the the outer oil ships. Is that all going okay with you, sound-wise? Yep. Sounds good, Davey. Okay. Uh, you can see the, the two Errol-class boats there, which have the multifunction with the cranes for doing the, the lift-on, lift-off islands of, of North Ronaldsea and Papua Westry and the Bargain, which does the load-on, load-off islands only. Pretty much here's the rest of the fleet, minus our smallest flagship, the, uh, the Golden Mariana, is not showing it in there. Um, it's a small passenger only, only vessel. Uh, there is a distinction on, on the types here as well. We've got the hard ramp boats which operate like the photograph on the bottom left of the screen there. That shows the iron hollow coming on, uh, on a ramp. Whereas the Hoy Head uses a plan arrangements like the, the Outer North Island. OK, um, just uh, looking at a, a global context now, I've pulled a couple of couple of images off the High Seas 3 project, uh, one of the justification files for this. So you, you see the, the chopped up pie chart on the, on the left here. That's the global position of all the, all the ferries in the world. Um, the red segments are those in Europe. So you'll immediately see in Europe occupies about a third of the entire world's Ropax ferries in this continent, which is possibly something that doesn't really spring to mind. You might notice Indonesia, Japan uh, are fairly significant. Philippines are significant other areas of the world where these types of ships operate. Now, part of our, uh, our um, study into this uh, project for IC3 was the uh, the suitability of you know the types of ship the, 
these ended up being relatively small ships because of the the fact of getting enough fuel on them and the technology available to propel or to drive them with uh, fuel cells or whatever we have available at the time. And I can promise you this is not a warm up for Trond, but uh, if you look at the, uh, the image in red, that shows Norway having the, the biggest proportion of, of these ferries by a substantial margin. Uh, sort of uh, UK, uh, Greece, Italy coming loosely second um, in that the Turkey areas as well. So um, there's probably a reason for this that why you find most of these hydrogen ferry projects have ended up in Europe. It's because we have the most suitable ships for that pretty much in the world in this area. So uh, what's been going on in hydrogen ferries over the last 20 years? There's been a lot of projects globally, um, partic particularly in Europe, of course. Uh, I've been looking at all sorts of fuel cells and different types of them. I don't know if you're aware, there's multiple different types of fuel cells. From solid oxide to proton exchange membrane, high temperature, low temperature, different technologies. Um, going back 20 years ago, uh, there was a number of projects, uh, Rolls-Royce and um, a number of different companies looking at trying to use uh, high temperature fuel cells burn methanol or, or current fuels, even diesels at the time. LNGs was used in early days. Pretty much all of that has now settled out into the last decade has pretty much settled in the proton exchange membrane one, which is ones we're seeing coming through now. And these are the type of ones you'll find in the bus projects and the hydrogen cars that you are available to buy. The, Possibility though, the problem has a lot of the power scale has been kept down to the sort of auto automotive size. So 50 kilowatts, 2030 is kind of kind of common in that that uh, that type of uh, vehicle. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at quite a number of, of uh, different projects from around uh, UK and uh, and Europe, uh, which have been influencing. What, uh, what's going forward and, and what we're doing just now. Um, first one is uh, this This is the the uh, Bristol hydrogen boat. Now th this type of ferry is as simple as it gets. Uh, this is a, a boat which you just use in a harbour area uh, only. Uh, this type of boat is not restricted to Bristol. There are uh, several of these in Europe. There's one in Bergen, there's, there's a canal trip boat in Amsterdam, there's one in Marseille Harbour, there's, I think there's one in Venice as well, all pretty similar to this, this, this one here. This, uh, and this particular project was funded by Bristol City Council. It's still on the go today and you can book a trip on it for, if you want to charter it for £145 an hour according to the way Website and, and you can chart yourself a hydrogen boat to have a trip around Bristol dockyard just now. Now you might notice the uh, it is a, a very simple power package. If you look at the sort of the, the, the diagram of the components at the, on the bottom right of the screen there, you see a, a small 12 kilowatt PEM fuel cell, a small hydrogen tank which is supplied from with industrial hydrogen from cylinders, power management system battery and uh, electric motor. This is pr pretty much the base of most of the uh, exchange memory drive ferries we're gonna, gonna be looking at. So this, this is where it starts at the, at the bottom end of the, of the project scope. This one now, this it really excited me, this project. This one is uh, in Germany, it's a Zemschips Alsterwässe. It's um, it's a, a boat. It was uh, or a project started off 2007, uh, ran through to about 2012. Uh, it's fantastic. Now we're look, almost looking at a a proper ferry here. The only thing is it doesn't leave the, the river, and it runs around the Hamburg area and and the, the near near area. This one was kind of inspirational for surf and turf in some ways. Uh, 
the fuel cells, which you'll see in the in the cutaway diagram uh, on the on the bottom there, is the uh, proton motor type 148 kilowatt. And uh, later on, we'll we'll notice these uh, also used in sort of tougher down and down the uh, Kirtle Pier. Uh, again, we have the these similar setup uh, fuel cells, uh, hydrogen storage tanks, batteries, propulsion motor. But th this the the key thing about this project was the actual fuel cells were marine classified. The fuel cells were the, the boat design. A lot of the aspect wasn't, uh, so it doesn't actually become a seagoing boat. Um, so that that was a, a hugely influential project. A number of partners on that. Uh, there was the Germanic Alloy Proton Motors, the Lindy Group, which did a very innovative fueling solution to that. Um, and uh, it, uh, it unfortunately, it's not it's not running today. But that's that's not a, a fault of the boat at all. This is the bunker station for the Zem Ships project, and uh, done or uh, designed by Lindy now. Again, a fantastic piece of engineering. Um, we have, if you look at the photograph on the left, it's a liquid hydrogen supply. Uh, it's got a processing or a regasification unit, and it will supply compressed hydrogen to the vessel, and it will deliver um, 50 kilos of hydrogen in 12 minutes, which is a superb piece of equipment um, for the this project. Unfortunately, I think it's becoming the Achilles heel as well, whether that was due to cost, but that fuel station no longer operates. Um, the technology is fantastic. I think the intention was that uh, they'd have other outlets for the gas that are nearby that fuel station, which unfortunately didn't come to pass. So I think that is the, the downfall of, the, of that project, which is, is a shame because that is a, is a superb uh, design of of uh, vessel for that that area. Now, uh, this project was never built, but I've got to talk about it because it, it's awesome. This is for San Francisco Bay. It was a laboratory on behalf of Red and White Tour Boat Company in, in San Francisco. And it really to thirty five notes. Think was it ever meant to be built, but the, it was the project was designed to see if it could be built. Um, so the uh, what what the upshot was at the end of the project, the U.S. Coast Guard and American Bureau of Shipping Classification Society at the end of it said, "Yes, I think you could build that if you wanted to." Um, the, I mean, the statistics go on and on. The amount of liquid hydrogen that was required was is about was about 20 percent of the capacity of the United States at the time. This is about 2015. So there was enormous uh, statistics that involved in running this. However, uh, the, no, the, in, in the report as well came a couple of points that the environmental societal benefit of the whole thing over 30 years could be between 2.6 and 11 million dollars, which you know is significant. But um, the the other conclusion was the unit price, fuel sales, and all the equipment and fuel would need to come down significantly before this one would be viable. Now, the the beauty of that project is that it spawned another one, which this one's real, and it's also uh, San Francisco. Uh, this is the water go round project. This you look at the bottom. This is the vessel being built, which is meant to be in the water at the end of. Last year it isn't at the moment. There is some delay on it. Again, a lot of the learning from the SFB project went into this. Um, but the statistics are just nowhere near as uh, as outlandish as the uh, as the, the breeze, and they're more in in line with uh, 
what uh, another uh, a whole lot of other projects coming coming through our, uh, our uh, delivering. Again, it's a 24 meter, 21 meter boat, 360 uh, kilowatt heavy fuel cells, and uh, 240 kg of hydrogen on board. Which it's uh, that, that's not really uh, outlined. You thought that's pretty much in line with a lot of a lot of these other current projects that are going going on. Um, now um, I'm going to move on to something completely different. Uh, up until two years ago, all of the projects in the marine sort of field were uh, fuel cell. Uh, this this company CMB, which is I think is Compania Maritime, Belgian shipping company decided to start looking into uh, co-fueling uh, marine engines with hydrogen. So they uh, put a project together called Hydroville. The, the vessel you see is in is active now. It's a uh, standard equipment on it, no electric drive, no fuel cells, no batteries. Simple, well-established diesel engine with uh, hydrogen co-fuel. Uh, this is called the H2ICD, Hydrogen to Internal Combustion Engine Diesel. Uh, this boat does 22 knots and consumes 50 to 70% hydrogen uh, to displace the diesel out of it. No new technology is required here, uh, apart from the hydrogen being stored on board. This boat was designed from scratch, runs around Antwerp Harbour and River with uh, 13 passengers, which is what the, the Belgian authorities allow for that type, type of boat. So this, this has been uh, quite a, a sea change. And you'll see uh, once we talk about uh, our own projects in a little minute, uh, we'll see where this has led us to. This picture you see now is a, a very exciting one. That's a, that's a marine diesel engine or what or diesel cycle. It's, this is a joint venture also between anglo Belgian Diesel Company and the CMB Company. Now they're launching a hydro version, hydrogen version of a marine diesel engine. And now we're talking, start to talk real ship engine power scale here. I'm talking 0.8 to 2.8 megawatt per engine here. Um, so we're, uh, we're getting into the, the big ship field uh, of uh, engine three. So we're, we're skipping over a lot of these, these fuel cells which are you know, uh, coming with about 250 kilowatt per unit now. So this this raises the bar by a factor of 10 above above these that are uh, currently in, in production. So we see um, an outlet for this engine. Uh, there's also a, the Port of Antwerp have ordered a tug using these engines to be delivered next year uh, with four megawatt propulsion capacity in it, uh, which is possibly quite a landmark. So the, this company is also uh, involved in a Japanese project called Hydro Bingo, which uh, is involved with a Japanese shipping company, which we believe is going to go to a zero combustion, a zero emission hydrogen engine. And the details of that are still to emerge. I know the the companies behind this are striving to that to uh, to uh, develop or install the diesel engine with. Or the cycle uh, engine without uh, any uh, nitrous oxide emissions at all. Two other projects are coming out of the same same sort of area. The Hydrocart, it's a well-established uh, uh, wind farm service vessel for uh, uh, wind farms in the Southern North Sea. It's a 2,000 horsepower. Uh, diesel installation will be consuming 200 kilos of compressed hydrogen along with uh, with a small amount of, of diesel as well. So the, this whole sector is coming really from some left field into the fuel cell area um, and it's probably delivering significant number of projects uh, uh, with uh, sort of the mainstream uh, of the fuel cell which has been going on for, for 10, 20 years now. Um, so you're going to watch that one with interest because this this you you do not need to reinvent the wheel when you're uh, you you put these engines in a boat. All you do is change the storage of the fuel. 
OK, um, I'm just going to quickly look at now how, how these projects fit in with what we are doing here. <coughs> I don't know if everyone's uh, uh, up to date with all the hydrogen projects. Probably a large number of the audience out there are, uh, are up to date, so I'll quickly run through them and, and show how we refer to the what has been going on globally up, up and European wise up till now. Okay, Surf and Turf, as I mentioned earlier on, that's a well-established project. Uh, we learned quite a lot about that, about road transports to touch on in a minute. But the biggest learning point was the the fuel cell unit on the pier, which which drew from the inspiration of the of the Zem ships project uh, back in uh, 2015, I think, when we started that off. Um, well, we've had some issues with hydrogen production, but the f certainly using the fuel cells been in, it's been been a been a big learning curve if uh, no one out there seen seen this image before there or what's down couple pier the uh, the fuel cell unit is the thing with the proton motor the blue container on the uh, sort of the left bottom of the picture there uh, inside there's the, the two uh, fuel cell units um uh for the generation of electricity on the pier which uh, we use for uh, supplying the two or three of the berths down the pier for uh, our ferries when they're tied up overnight. Um, waste heat from that then is used to heat the the crane, the two buildings adjacent to the the, uh, the fuel cell unit. So overall plant efficiencies can be very high here. A uh, big hit project. Uh, you've probably heard about that many times. Uh, we've sort of gleaned. Uh, uh, open up another route to hydrogen transport on that and uh, the vans around about the harbour and again the fuel station up at Hudson and quite a number of learning experiences come out of that and uh, particularly on, on reliability issues and uh, and serviceability things which which is a is a, a thing with this development technology here um as I mentioned earlier on, transporting the hydrogen by sea uh, was a was a learning experience for us with the uh, the differential between the road transport rules, which uh, transpired to be not as stringent as the IMDG, which is International Maritime Dangerous Goods. So as, as soon as you put something on a ship, that's that's the standard it complies to, and the number of things we had to do to overcome that. The bottom, bottom picture shows a, like a, a stowage arrangement with a, a three metre uh, 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 low flash point area or the uh, protected area around about uh, the uh, trailer on the deck. So I'm going to quickly look at the two, two uh, ship based projects that we're running here. Um, one is High Dime, which will draws on the, uh, the Hydroville experience or possibly both of these kicked off at a similar time. The the company in the middle on the top, Ulemco, is the technology provider here. They're the uh, ultra low mission company. Um, it's supply the H2 ICED uh, engine conversion. Ferguson Marine have uh, now morphed into Ferguson Port Glasgow. So these people are still in the project or in this one at any rate, uh, uh, providing the support and the and the installation drawings for. The, this project. A quick outline of what we actually have in the shop and see. Um, we've got a tank pack in the middle of the of the vessel here, which you'll see in the, the arrangement drawing. There's a blue hatched area. Um, this is to store 25 kilos of hydrogen in the in this area. Uh, we uh, looked at the you know the total of all the, the kit involved on this installation is un, under a ton. Um, looking at a, an equivalent energy and batteries, we're even with the most modern technology, looking at about 2.7 tons, so about 1.7 tons less to uh, have hydrogen in the, in this boat here. So that shows a bit of an advantage, even on a dead weight restricted vessel like the Sharp and Sea, where we go with hydrogen on that. A quick view of the tank pack there, uh, showing the uh, the cylinders being prepared to go in in the Boat. They're in place now. The uh, the technology required us to build out a special containment area for it for the for the, the cylinders themselves, which is known as the tank containment space, uh, which is currently being finished off. We hope to finish that off at the the dry dock in May, which with the current 
situation we're looking to have to postpone that uh, till probably July at the earliest at the moment. Uh, th this is a quick look at the engine technology that, or the conversion kit. Uh, the photograph on the, on the left shows the the engine inlet manifold, which is the swept bit on the top of the of the picture there. And uh, the Ulemco, the hydrogen conversion uh, manifold, uh, which is shown on the right of the of the photograph of the here. Um, and we have a, a small hydrogen line comes from the tank part at low pressure uh, through double skin pipe all the way uh, up up to the engine. High dime two is, is something we aspire to at the moment. Uh, we are uh, trying to uh, to get through to that. Um, scale up of high dime one, which is an auxiliary engine only, uh, would be moving at a main propulsion engine, more hydrogen capacity in a longer route, again using a ferry. Uh, but we see the uh, the CMB projects possibly taking a bit of that uh, or, or going a bit further. But again, uh, they're on either the, the commercial, the tugs and, uh, and the, the small passenger uh, craft sort of side of it. So that we think there's probably still uh, potential for us in, the, in that area. OK, here uh, we have the High Seas 3, which is uh, one you may or may not have heard about. That's the uh, a fuel cell replacement vessel for the, the Sharpensy route itself, um, which is a technology proving exercise. We have to get an, a, a marine approved power plant uh, to put in that vessel, which is something that doesn't quite exist at the moment. Uh, we have fuel cell units that are approved but a whole whole power system we don't have. So uh, I'll just bring up the partners quickly here, uh, which you can see um, Ferguson Marine at the top. Uh, you're probably aware of there's quite a lot of history on that. Um, at the moment, uh, they've they are now out of this project and to be re replaced in quite short time by uh, CMAL, the uh, the ship owning company of the Scottish government. Um, just some progress on the, the, this uh, project. Um, there is six fuel cell units to go into the High Seas 3. Um, the small scale power tri plant trials was carried out last year with one uh, fuel cell unit and power control equipment to suit in Kongsberg. Uh, that was successfully completed. Uh, the new, new plans for that is the new power plant is to be completed by March 2020. That's not going to happen now. That's going to be looking at June to September area. That's a three month. Uh, the, the proving trial of the full uh, rig has to be three months uh, on full load and, and cycled up and down. So that was to commence in March, finish in June. Now, laterally, we're looking at June, finish in September. I've got a horrible feeling that's going to end up pushing back a few months uh, again as a result of what we're seeing just now. Um, yeah, at the end of this, we'd have class approval for the entire power plant system for this uh, ship build. Um, this is the high C3 build. This is what it's currently spec'd as. Um, I put the box up there. To, It'll make it look similar to what we've seen in the previous one. So the vessel will operate in the island Orkney. It'll be classed as a Euro C, which would allow it to go out of North Isles as well. 40 metres, 100 passengers, 70 tonnes of 75 tonnes rural of cargo and uh, driven by 625 kilowatt PIM fuel cells, uh, holding about 350 kilos of Hydrogen, which is about enough, we think, for a day and a half running at the moment. The idea is that the, we're still hoping that the or CMAL and Scottish Government finance this, um, a finance bid to go in at the fall of this year with a, a builder procured for next year. Uh, we'll see how that goes with, uh, with current issues. Um, one thing that's slightly deviating from the, you know, the the ferries technology line is is the operating of the vessel, which everybody forgets about, which is a thing we definitely haven't forgot about here. It's um, there's a number of issues to make sure that the crews are trained and the and the safety management systems 
are, um, are suitable or approved by the transport authority that uh, we uh, we have to deal with, which is the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. Um, time's running on, so I'll, I'll not go on too much about that since it's slightly off, off the track, but a huge amount of work is going on with uh, Orkney College and Orkney Department and uh, ourselves at ferries uh, into the, uh, the issues uh, regarding this. So, um, so to end up, up with, I've, um, what's stopping us from getting on with it uh, just now? Um, I've put a few points all in, all in amber. Um, uh, one of them, regulatory approval, uh, which you know the projects we're looking at uh, will push through uh, with high C3. If it that will push a lot of the boundaries away from that. But we're also seeing these. Uh, other countries, which I've not deliberately not talked about Norway, uh, given the next presentation coming up, um, that uh, a lot of these boundaries are, are quickly being pushed back and, uh, and uh, conditions are being met. Again, infrastructure. Um, we do have a, an increase in infrastructure in Orkney for uh, production of hydrogen. That needs to step up significantly, but um, looking at the uh, looking at the possibility of uh, Retrofit hydrogen arrangements with uh, these uh, co fueling uh, projects, where you would be able to uh, convert existing equipment to run on hydrogen. I think is probably a thing that might might be able to start using that hydrogen a lot quicker than waiting for uh, uh, fully committed uh, fuel cell or other projects to come through. The training and familiarisation we, we're, we're, we're working on. Uh, reliability and re resilience, which is, a, is an issue, um, which we've seen with all the projects that are going on. Um, training and, uh, and familiarisation is, is, is a, a certain, uh, certainly a, an issue here, uh, which we are starting to realise and uh, look at uh, training schemes, um, which uh, certainly with the crew training for I see three, and remember we built Surf and Tough rig as, uh, as a marine training rig. Uh, we, we're ready to, for that. Costs again are, are, are kind of uh, working against most mainstream projects, but they're coming down. Uh, but the, the last point here is the scalability. It's the most exciting thing I, I see coming through this. There's great, great technologies coming through here because the, the main thing that, that kept the hydrogen of anything but the smallest boats. It's the amount you can carry, it's the amount of room that it takes up to carry it. I'm seeing um, uh, technology involving uh, absorbing hydrogen into oils uh, and, uh, and other uh, solid materials coming through uh, quickly here. Uh, and I think the, uh, the liquid organic hydrogen is the one that excites me most because you can you absorb hydrogen in, into oil and then you store it as a stable liquid and you can get that back easily. You use ordinary tanks in a, in a ship, which, you know, ships are not particularly round, tubular shaped unless it's a submarine, but uh, that's where, where I think that uh, that is, is leading us uh, quickly down that road. And that's just thank you very much for me for, for listening and, and I hope uh, you heard this clearly and um, I look forward to your questions. Yeah, thank, yeah. Thank, thanks very much, David. That was really good. Uh, um, there's a pile of questions I'm seeing coming on the chat. So uh, our plan is maybe just if there was, a, we'll give you one or two questions, David, maybe before you, yeah, go for it. Yeah. you sign off that are specific to you. So I think Jane was collating the questions. So we'll maybe get her just to ask a couple of the questions in general, and then just to let people know, I should have said at the beginning, we'll have a five minute break sort of thing between that to allow people a comfort break before we go on to Tron. But Jane, do you have a couple of general questions to see? There's an awful lot of questions there, so it's going to be quite tricky. Yeah, sure. There's lots of really good questions coming in. So I'll just pick out one or two, as Ian said, and we can save the rest for, for the discussion at the end. Um, firstly, a couple of questions from James Ferguson. How fast could you refuel a ferry with 250 kilos of hydrogen? And more generally, do you think these fast refills are the best way to go? Um, an alternative would be to have the ferry plugged into a, an electrolyzer overnight, for example. It, it doesn't really matter. I, I mean, uh, ideally, if you want a rapid fueling system, uh, is uh, 
it's what time you have allowed for it um, and whether you can safely leave your ship tied up with a hydrogen hose plugged in it overnight and if you need people to be there to operate the hydrogen plant or or for a safety system for uh, on the boat watching the you know the pressure rise and keeping an eye on temperatures and, and all of those things I suspect the regulatory authorities will require that in in the first instance so there's um, there'd be quite a lot of extra labour cost uh, involved if if you would be uh, doing a, a slow fill overnight, uh, wh as whereas if you did a quick fill uh, in the order of the the same ships at uh, 50 kilos in 12 minutes, that that type of that fill rate, you'd you'd be using a lunch time or a, you know your your normally uh, your normal bunkering time for a, a week's fuel on on the, the shopping scene might be 20 minutes. So I mean the, the the systems are set up for that, but you know there, there is plenty of scope to look at longer stopovers. You know we got a, a lunchtime and then some time between between runs, morning and evening. So whether you do a, a splash and dash to use a Formula One terminology, and, and a main fill or or uh, or or just a main fill. Great, thank you. And two questions specific to Orkney. Um, Two questions from Jerry Gibson. The first one, are hydrogen vessels the best option for replacing Orkney Ferries old vessels? And the second one, would it be better for the Isles to have their own hydrogen production for their ferries? Um, now, there's a whole number of issues that you can touch on there. Um, certainly, the, uh, if you, you're involved in the value chain, you know, you, at the moment, uh, we're using oil. You're basically, you know, you're you're buying a product, and you you don't see the benefit of that 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 whole piece of uh, the economic generation of that money it just is exported immediately out of the islands. Um, um, as I've said before to many people around, that uh, there, there, there's a chance to de democratise the, the 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 fuel system or the, the energy system here uh, if if that was produced in the islands, be electric. Be it uh, be it biogas, be it uh, methanol, yeah, there are, there is a number of different fuels uh, out there. I mean, I haven't touched on that in this. I mean, uh, uh, the other the other competing technologies uh, that are, are out there, but certainly the, if, if we could keep that economic benefit in the in the islands, it would be would be best. Great, thanks. And maybe just one more question before we have a short break. Um, would Orkney's internal routes be suited to hydrogen fueled catamarans rather than monohulls? Um, some of them would be. Um, um, the, the terminals wouldn't, which is it's another thing. Uh, as, as you probably realise, uh, most of the catamarans are higher, uh, you know, they're higher freeboard out of the water and they're much more beamy. So, which it'd be unlikely you would be able to use all of the terminals. You might be able to design a vessel so you could use so that like the uh, the the ramps are all on the one side, and then you find the, another island where they, it requires it the other side. So that there's quite a lot more engineering involved in that. Um, we were finding with the 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 low um, the uh, the low energy or the low emission technology due to the cost of it. The, tended to go to the very lightweight ship options. Um, again, we've seen a couple of projects in, in Norway with battery catamarans and uh, so one of the Danish projects on battery have been very, very lightweight ships to keep keep the mass down, um, which uh, gets the efficiency up. Not necessarily all, all catamarans, but um, uh, catamarans at small size become quite difficult if you want to put a lot of cargo in. There, and there is there is a sweet spot for that, that type of form which we might be coming near on the on the uh, over North Isles. Again, uh, there's a, a, a sea keeping issue uh, for catamarans are good for uh, going across seaways. So your main swells are from the side. If they're head on big big swells, uh, you want to be avoiding slamming the tunnel on them, which is the uh, where the, uh, a wave would go up and, and slam the bridge between the, the two holes. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there is options uh, on, on changing routes or if that was to be the, the chosen technology, but there's a, just a whole number of issues in there. 
Okay, th th thanks again, Davy, for that. That's been really interesting. And I see there's a whole lot of congratulations on the chat there, so you can read them at your leisure. <laughs> if you maybe just take a, 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 a five minute break, people will start again at 20 past eight in, in UK time. Uh, with with Tron, it gives you a chance to have a quick comfort break. And if Davy, if you don't mind hanging around, there might be a couple of questions at the end that'll be general. Okay. Oh, I know, bother. It'll be interesting to see uh, Tron's presentation because uh, I I deliberately kept away from Norwegian because there, there is a number of uh, a number of projects there are very big ones which I'm sure Tron will be uh, going to be telling us about. Thanks very much.
OK, folks, by by my watch, that's a uh, that's us on 20 past. So uh, I'll just <coughs> not mess around and ask Tron Stromgren from who's got a great title as an ocean technology innovator as his title for his job working for GEC Ocean Technology. A number of people in Orkney know him well. He's been here many times and and talked to us about ferries and we've met him in Norway. So a, a great friend of Orkney indeed. So Tron, can I ask you to take over and give you a presentation? Yes, thank you, Ian. Can you hear me? Yeah, here you're fine. Yeah. Good. Uh, First of all, thanks to David. Very interesting presentation. I learned a lot. And now I will share my screen. Uh, I'll find the right. So do you yeah. see the presentation? Yep. Yeah. OK. Then things are working. So I will tell you the story about uh, what's going on in Norway uh, in this uh, maritime hydrogen uh, yeah, world. And uh, I've been working uh, uh, with hydrogen uh, in maritime uh, use for like four years. <clears throat> and I have two different jobs. One is in this GCE ocean technology. Uh, but then when presenting now, about ships, then I'm mostly uh, presenting Ocean Highway Cluster, which is the Norwegian uh, national cluster for uh, use of hydrogen in the maritime sector. And this is what we, of course, want to not see in the future. Uh, and what we are doing in this Ocean Highway Cluster which was founded uh, like one year and three months ago. <clears throat> we are uh, four persons working in this uh, management of this cluster, located in Flore, north of Bergen. We are either managing some of these different projects, or we are partner in them, or we have collaboration with the projects. So uh, you see the different segments which are now going on in Norway. It's uh, tourist vessels like High Fjord. Uh, it's express uh, vessels uh, commuting uh, uh, passengers and Ropax ferries. And uh, some projects are connected to cruise lines and uh, offshore supply vessels. Also one project going on to decarbonize part of the Norwegian oil and gas business production fisheries, cargo, uh, things are going on there. And then we have this uh, number of projects going on to produce and deliver hydrogen along the coast, this high infra. Uh, we have some projects going on with the different sea, sea farming and use of hydrogen to reduce emissions. And then uh, some, uh, yeah, some players are now uh, making large consortium to produce large amounts of hydrogen. Uh, and then we have this um, uh, work going on to export also hydrogen to, let's say, to Japan through the Northeast Passage. So that's about uh, the things I'm working about. And lots of things are happening in Norway and part all the reason for that is that um, the government has made regulations. Uh, and one of these regulations is that uh, from 2026 or before, if the technology is ready, uh, no fossil fuel will be allowed to enter the Norwegian World Heritage Fjords. So that means uh, some of these cruise line companies are not preparing with batteries, with the hydrogen, to be able to enter these fjords. Uh, and also, one more important thing, um, which is a key driver, is that uh, uh, all, yeah, nearly all the Norwegian Ropex uh, ferry routes are 
owned by the Norwegian government, the Norwegian Public Roads Administration, and uh, all, nearly all the um, high-speed passenger vessels. These routes are owned by the different counties in Norway. And then uh, this uh, Norwegian Public Roads Administration, two years ago, they made a tender saying that one of these Ropax ferries should be zero emission and should be running on hydrogen in the future. So that ferry is now being built due to this public procurement. And then now, uh, this is a map showing Trondheim in Trøndelag uh, County, three different routes. Uh, there was a tender two years ago, uh, and uh, last autumn the result was delivered from five different consortium that had uh, made their technical solutions to run these ferries or these uh, high-speed vessels uh, zero emission. And the longest route to Kristiansund is, uh, is like uh, 95 nautical miles or 180 kilometers. So it's a long route and, and uh, you know, 275 passengers and 35 knots. So it's a uh, lot of energy for these routes. And now Sogn of Fjordane County, where I live, uh, are collaborating with Trøndelag County, which this uh, slide is on, and also collaborating with the uh, Troms and Finnmark County up north in Norway. Uh, they are making uh, um, tender together uh, because from 2024 these um, three counties will have most of the vessels running on zero emission propulsion and that means either hydrogen or electric battery power so it's very exciting these days and we are involved in this uh, process Also, this is just to show you, like uh, David told, lots of projects are going, around, uh, are going on around the world. Uh, those who are members in Ocean Highway Cluster, these companies, they can enter this uh, uh, database we have. And it's, uh, we have listed uh, more than 40 different ships, which is uh, then uh, some kind of hydrogen project connected to these ships. Some of them are being built, some are being planned. Uh, yeah. So then I will tell you about some Norwegian projects. And Norled is uh, one of the four large uh, ferry operators in Norway. Uh, and they won this tender that the Norwegian Public Roads Administration uh, had. Uh, so they are going, they are now building this ferry. It's being built these days. It's a Ropax ferry for 80 cars, nearly 300 passengers, 82 meters long. And on board, there will be a 400 kilowatt PEM fuel cell from Ballard. <coughs> um, and one thing which is special is that uh, the Norwegian Public Road Administration said that this system on this ferry should be scalable also to make longer routes. This is a route in Rogaland, southwest in Norway. And then uh, Norled uh, meant that, okay, to be scalable, we have to have lots of hydrogen on board. That means it must be liquid hydrogen. So this ferry will be running on liquid hydrogen. Uh, by now, there are no production of liquid hydrogen in Norway, but to start operating this ferry in 2021, then hydrogen will be drawn from uh, uh, France or yeah, some place in Europe to the ferry. Uh, but that's to get started. And then there are some projects going on in Norway these days to uh, produce liquid hydrogen planning to be ready in 2024. And uh, also, actually, Norden is going to build one more of these ferries in this uh, EU flagship project. And that ferry will be uh, running on pressurized hydrogen. So, 
then we move to these high speed vessels. So this is a new design. Uh, it was launched uh, the 3rd of September last year. It's a design by Brødrene Å, which is a shipbuilding and design company located close to where I live. Uh, and uh, part of my job the last two years was to manage this project, uh, this project developing this, uh, this uh, hydrogen propulsion high-speed vessel. It's, um, it can take uh, yeah, up to 200 passengers, uh, travel 35 knots, like 2.2 megawatt propulsion. Um, and this is then decided to travel on these routes along the coast, for instance, from Trondheim to Kristiansund, this 95 nautical miles route. And uh, this is a carbon fiber uh, structure, very light and optimal uh, design of the hull, so that makes it very energy efficient. Uh, there are other vessels like this, nearly like this, running on the coast now, and the same size and the same speed, and they op operate uh, on, let, let's say, between 7 to 20 liters diesel per nautical miles at, at 35 to 33 knots. Some of these vessels, uh, like the 30 meter long ones, have also uh, uh, they can take cargo and cars on the deck aft. Uh, for this vessel, uh, the plan is to have compressed hydrogen uh, in uh, three tanks on the top, and then the fuel cells are in a room where the H2 sign is. And then electrical propulsion. And this company, Brødrene they have already built a lot of electric uh, propulsion uh, vessels. Okay, this uh, vessel is uh, going is now being built. Four of these, they are going to operate um, uh, this year on the Norwegian coast on this Hurtigruten or Kystruten, uh, traveling from Bergen to Kirkenes. Uh, those who are being built now are built on LNG and also a large battery pack. I think uh, like five megawatt hours, and that will make them able to enter these Norwegian World Heritage Fjords on battery. Um, but the design is made ready to uh, have uh, hydrogen and fuel cells on board for main propulsion in the future. So this uh, Havila company, they got uh, lots of funding from a Norwegian funding scheme last year. And they plan to have like 3.2 megawatt fuel cells on board uh, this ship or these ships, and then uh, 3,500 kilos of liquid hydrogen stored on board. And they are working all, uh, on this project. Okay, uh, Norway has a lot of uh, emissions from the oil and gas business. Um, so then Equinor, who leases this vessel, they have a plan to use ammonia for uh, most of the energy used to propulsion of this ship. And there's a project going on now, or starting now, and the design period is now, and it will end up then with a one-year test period. Uh, with a, a two megawatt uh, solid oxide fuel cell running on ammonia that will uh, be used to deliver 60 to 70 percent of the energy to this vessel. Uh, by now it's running on an LNG main engine and that engine will also be on board when this ammonia testing is going on. Uh, then we have some projects going on. The start of this project are going on now, and that is to reduce, reduce emission from fish, uh, fishing vessels. <clears throat> um, 
and the projects I know about is then uh, not hydrogen for the main propulsion, but as part of the energy system. And there was a tender being launched launched some weeks ago from the yeah, Norwegian Fishing Association, something like that. And uh, and then some there will be some funding for uh, ship designers designing uh, fishing vessels with hydrogen as part of the energy system. And they're also being part of this. So then I jump from ships uh, to uh, offshore wind, which, uh, you know, east coast of uh, Scotland. Equinor has been part of this, building this Sheringham Shoal and Dungeon and also have won this uh, Dogger Bank, 3.6 gigawatt to be installed. Um, and then I will tell you about this project. Uh, uh, I was actually one of the five persons inventing this in June 2016, and we have got a lot of funding from the Norwegian uh, um, yeah, Innovation Norway. Uh, the thing is that no Equinor plans to install uh, 11 8 megawatt, 8 megawatt um, wind turbines on the Tampen oil field in the north uh, of the North Sea. And the reason for that is because 23% of the total CO2 emission uh, in Norway comes from the uh, gas generators on the Norwegian continental shelf. So then the plan is on Tampen field that uh, this Turbines will deliver maybe 40% of the energy for these two platforms. But when there's no wind, there's no electric power. So our plan is to have excess, excess um, wind turbines and then delivering electric power to the platforms. But uh, the excess electric power will be used to uh, produce hydrogen in this yellow device in the middle of the slide then storing hydrogen on the seabed in those purple tanks. And when there's no wind, they transfer the hydrogen back to this yellow device. And then the fuel cells on board will produce electric power and then deliver to the platform. So that means uh, there will be um, stable zero emission energy supply, energy supply for the platforms. And also in the future, when these uh, offshore vessels or other vessels run on hydrogen, they can come here and bunker hydrogen in open sea to export or for propulsion. And then uh, this is Trondheim, which uh, they have these three different routes ending up high speed vessels. They are going to be zero emission from 24. And then uh, if uh, hydrogen could be a part of this solution, but uh, there will be a problem storing, let's say, five tons of hydrogen on the port in the center of Trondheim. So then we have this solution with the subsea hydrogen storage, maybe like one kilometer off, off the harbor on the seabed. We can store hydrogen and there's a pipeline going to the pier. And then we can just bunker exactly the number of kilos hydrogen needed. And then hydrogen could be produced on the on the port during night time and this cheap electric power and stored for use in the daytime. So this is uh, the members in this ocean highway cluster. Uh, and my last slide is this uh, telling you that if you have nothing to do on the 14th or 15th of, of October this year, we uh, have this annual uh, maritime Hydrogen and Marine Energy Conference in Flora in Norway. Last year we had 160 people attending from 19 nations. So there's some links here you can follow if you want. So that was what I had to show you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Trond. Uh, and I can thoroughly recommend going to Flora. We were there last year and uh, a very good conference on everything hydrogen and well run. So so I can do that. So uh, just as we did with Davy, first of all, maybe one or two questions. Uh, 
hopefully gents had a, cra a chance to pull up one or two of the ones uh, specific to, to Tron's uh, presentation and then we'll just open it up to the floor for a bit more discussion when maybe we'll bring Davey back in as well and just talk of things generally in hydrogen. So Jen, have you got a couple for Tron there? I see there's been quite a few. Yeah, loads of questions coming in there. Um, a first one here from Joe Porter. If hydrogen is being transported from France to Norway to power the Norled ferry, what are the implications for the carbon footprint of transporting the hydrogen? Is this counterproductive to the aim of reaching net zero? Yes, good question. And uh, and there's a lot of CO2, of course, uh, bad footprint uh, on this transport, but uh, we, ha we don't have at the moment, uh, or in let's say four years, uh, any liquid hydrogen in Norway. So this uh, transportation is then to get started, and it's not ideal, but uh, it's a it's a way to start. And then from 24, we there are plans to deliver liquid hydrogen from Norway, and that makes uh, the story better. Mm -hmm. I hope. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, a question here from Richie Ainsworth. It seems like hydrogen use in the maritime sector is widely supported in Norway. Is this the case? And if so, what can Orkney or Scotland learn from you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are uh, different support schemes from the Norwegian government, like Innovation Norway, like Enova, and like uh, Pilot E, which is, uh, was launched one week ago. Uh, and you know uh, there are hundreds or millions Norwegian kroner uh, in these schemes, and uh, the normal thing is to make some consortium uh, and then apply for money to either build a boat or to test some new methods of reducing emission in the maritime sector, or um, yeah, like build ferries uh, for this, uh, which the Norwegian public road administration has ordered so lots of good help from the government and it's uh, both administrative and political uh, wish to make this uh, zero mission come true in the maritime sector in norway great thank you um the next question from jerry gibson in norway is the hydrogen competitive in price with marine diesel and if so how has this been achieved ah that's a magic thing to to find a solution on uh, today, the if I if I tank my car with diesel, it costs like uh, thirteen kroner per liter. Uh, if I have a ship, I I pay uh, only the half, like six point five Norwegian kroner, uh, and uh, that makes it hard to compare on the price. Uh, one of the projects I've been uh, managing, we made uh, some very detailed, um, you know, uh, calculations on operating a hydrogen vessel and in a specific route, and then uh, taking in account that uh, maintenance of a um, hydrogen vessel will be less than for a diesel vessel, and also. Uh, uh, taking uh, into account that uh, hydrogen price will be like 45 Norwegian kroner per kilo in the future. Uh, then if the diesel price rise, rises with 20%, 20 then the operation cost of these vessels will be the same. So I think in the, in the near future, I think there will be a price, uh, equal price for operating the vessels. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Martin. What is the beam and displacement of the coastal steamer? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, but uh, just Google that and you'll find lots of information uh, on the web. No problem. Yeah, or send me uh, a mail, I can find out. Yeah, we can put you in touch, no problem. Um, a question from Neil. Are any of the projects looking at LOHC as carriers? No, that is um, not uh, very much uh, in focus in Norway. But um, I was in Japan in, in uh, February and, you know, from Brunei to Japan, starting in last uh, December last year, 450 kilos of hydrogen are transported every week. 
uh, with the LOHC. So it's uh, it's now going on, and I it will, be, it will be part of the presentations at the conference in Florida in October also about this uh, issue. But not in Norway, no. Okay, great. Uh, the next question coming from Max Carcass. Uh, what are the pros and cons of storing hydrogen on the seabed versus on a platform, for example? Um, could the maintenance be tricky? Yeah. Um, storing it on a platform uh, will be uh, more risky than storing it on the seabed. It also will have to be a lot of weight which is, uh, you know, part of the game on a pl floating platform, at least, and uh, storing it on the seabed. We have lots of space down there, um, and, you know, not accessible by any by people or with uh, you know, bad plans. Uh, but this method is now being developed. We are now going to have a pilot soon. So, of course, to maintain these tanks, uh, we'll see you. If it's difficult or not, uh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, another question here from James Ferguson. How clear are the tipping points between batteries, compressed hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, and ammonia as op optimal fuels? Yeah. Um, of course, battery is uh, very efficient because you have maybe like five to 10% uh, loss uh, from grid to propeller. Uh, so then, you know, in 2015, um, the first uh, large Norwegian uh, Ropax ferry was uh, on pad, it was uh, built and operating. And, uh, you know, there are lots of electric car ferries in Norway these days, and many are being built. So it's been a revolution. So of course, for short distances, uh, then a battery is optimal. Then uh, longer distances, uh, like these high-speed vessels, the batteries will be too heavy. So then hydrogen is a point. Uh, compressed hydrogen will be available in Norway, you know, maybe in one or two years. Um, along the coast, uh, liquid will be available in 2024. So compressed will be there first. And ammonia is uh, is you now being tested these days, so we'll see. And I think maybe ammonia will be for the deep sea, uh, you know, uh, shipping mostly, or in the North Sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Jen, Jen, can I suggest that maybe yeah. if David wants to unmute his microphone, I I wonder if he would have, be able to answer that question as well. Mm -hmm. If we start opening it up, obviously he mentioned in his presentation about different fuels. Have you got a thought on this, David? Yeah, I, you know, it's really about the amount of energy you need to make a fuel, um, what it's all about. So if you, you take a, a unit of electricity from a windmill or a hydro plant or anything you want and how much energy you get out at the other end, in its purest form of electrolyzer, you end up with hydrogen. Um, then you can pro keep processing it on to even get on uh, synthetic diesel, synthetic uh, methane. Uh, ammonia and a number of different fuels, methanols, all of those are possible. But of course, you, you expend more energy each time you transform the, the chemistry from the basic hydrogen and keep adding more molecules to make it into a stable fuel. So it becomes more energy intensive. So the most efficient way to use hydrogen is to use it as hydrogen. But the, the, the tipping point of hydrogen is, is getting enough stored. Um, that's why ammonia is, is, is gaining a bit of, uh, of uh, headline these days. You see Vaxala, one of the biggest engine companies in the world, they've, they've taken a project on looking at ammonia, but it's for big ships, big engines to run on ammonia because you can store a lot of it easily. The shorter sea shipping, which I mentioned in my presentation there, is, is, is hydrogen. Is it suitable for these boats under 2,000 gross tons at the moment. That's the best area because you can store enough of it to achieve your, your short runs without pushing the cost or the energy cost of your fuel up all the time. Um, so yeah, any, anything's possible. Um, remember the the, uh, the uh, we had a, a study done. Um, it was called Low Carbon Ferry. It was uh, some time ago, and it actually equated 
to run run a, a vessel on different fuels about the number of windmills you would need to achieve that. So it's like the more complex you make the fuel, from battery being the simplest, you know, so you need two windmills to operate a route, and then you go to hydrogen, you need three, and then suddenly if you go to other uh, uh, synthetic fuels, you might need four windmills to actually make the fuel to run that route. So it's really the whole infrastructure you need to, to keep it keep the fuel as simple as you can. So it would be my thought on that. Good. Thanks, Great. David. Do we have any other questions, Jen, that we can put to both the guys now? Maybe? Yeah, we, we've got some general questions that either um, either of you could answer. Um, a question from Neil. How do the engines like running on hydrogen? Does it do much damage to the engines or are there modifications needed to the cylinders, etc.? Um, and what are the emissions like? Um, the on the, the ULEMCO, the the H two ICD that they, they don't run on hundred uh, percent hydrogen. They run up, they, they run on the the low power range. It runs on on pure hydrogen. And you know the on a on a because you're running a, an engine is designed to run on diesel on on hydrogen. They're not de designed to run hundred percent on hydrogen because the the cylinder won't take it won't take the pressure. Now that you can design an engine to run on hydrogen, but then you couldn't run it on diesel because you, you're going to have to really unwind the technology back to the 1960s and have great big cylinders to keep the pressure down to get get your output out of it. So the the, the engines we're looking at and the one the uh, the, uh, the CMB and the ABC ones are, are basically uh, conventional diesels that will run up to 50 percent. Or even seventy percent with some reduced output on on hydrogen. Uh, I notice on on the hydrogen tug they're using after treatment to take any all the NOx out of the of the exhaust stream to have a, an extremely clean exhaust stream on that. So, uh, but I know that um, yeah, CMB seems to have taken over uh, Revolve Technologies, which were behind H two ICED, and they have a patent on a hundred percent hydrogen combustion engine. So. I'm just looking forward to seeing that coming through. Yeah, one of our <laughs> follow up questions was, is there any work on purely hydrogen fueled engines? Yeah, the answer to that is yes. Yeah, <laughs> good. Um, another question yeah. related to that. Sorry, Ian, go ahead. So I was just going to say this, Tron, got any thoughts on that? That was a. Uh, no, nothing, nothing, nothing to add on that. Yeah. OK. Um, a question from Matthew Finn. Are the operation and maintenance costs lower for a hydrogen ferry? And if so, any idea how much? OK, I can comment on that. Um, I don't have the exact number in my head, but we did uh, some very you know, uh, detailed calculations on that. And like in Norway, many of these routes have are run by catamarans, uh, high speed vessels. And uh, after maybe like 10 to 15,000 operating hours, uh, engines are being uh, uh, changed because they are, these are uh, light engines, heavy or uh, high speed uh, propulsion. Uh, so then these uh, vessels must be on the slipway. They have to cut a hole in the hull, take out the engines, and then replace the engines and then plaster and repair the hull. That takes maybe 14 days. You have to rent a ship to to operate in the route in these 14 days, that's very costly compared to change fuel cells. You just take them out and put the new one in. So that will save a lot of cost. And also um, no moving part in the fuel cell. And this electric uh, propulsion system, you have two bearings for electric motors. That's all moving parts. So that's very, I think it will be very low maintenance on these vessels. So then I think uh, that would be a benefit from uh, fuel cells and electric propulsion. Yeah, can I, can I add? Uh, I think, yeah, I think we, we noticed on one, a couple of the projects um, on uh, on Surf and Turf when we bought the fuel cells, uh, the Proton Motors ones, they were only we were only guaranteeing them for about, I think it was six or 7,000 hours before we'd have to change the membranes on them, uh, which was a bit of a worry uh, at that time. We notice now that the latest Ballard ones are, are going up to 30,000 hours on, on the membrane, so that they, in that space of time, the, the maintenance uh, requirement is, is improved by a factor of about six in the space of about, you know, same number of years. So, uh, 
So that that uh, that bodes well for reliability uh, or, uh, or or service requirements uh, for that type of machines. Mm. Great. Okay. Um, a question for Davy, um, specific to the UK stuff. Some of the project funding is due to come from the EU. Does Brexit jeopardise any of that? Potentially. Um, we one of our uh, high dime projects, UK funded through Innovate UK. Uh, at the moment, uh, High Seas 3 is still funded through uh, um, uh, Horizon 2020. Um, going forward, I'm not really sure what's going to happen uh, when Brexit finally materialises. Uh, if we stay in the hydrogen projects or we stay in any of the EU uh, development projects or not, that, that's not been clarified yet. But the ones we're in just now are, are fully funded and they're uh, safe at this time. Great. Um, a question here around uh, the training that you were talking about, Davy, that will be needed for the Marine staff. Um, is there training that exists um, at the moment? And maybe, Trond, maybe you could add to that in terms of the perspective from Norway. Have there been training schemes that have been particularly successful? Um, yeah, we, we recognise this training need really early on, uh, which was a thing. So we... we our expertise at Orkney Ferries is operating vessels, so uh, we've got, how are we going to train people? So um, we've been engaged with the MCA and uh, and uh, Orkney College for probably a good two or three years now to develop the hydrogen training scheme. Uh, it was just about at the uh, at the uh, uh, accreditation stage before Christmas, but unfortunately, the the a new team of surveyors come in and and made us rework it all um, so we're ju just at the point of getting that one uh, accredited um, as an e is nearest equivalent that because there is not an international standard on this this is this is the the, the huge stumbling block for for all of uh, all of uh, uh, you know the international governments so they normally go to the thing called the international maritime organization or standards say right we we just you pick that standard we adapt it to our needs and uh, and roll out a, a requirement there, there isn't one. Mm -hmm. um, so the MCA has allowed us to develop one which they will support for UK uh, uh, ships um, to allow us to operate them as uh, in the UK only, uh, which they will allow to use to. The, the wording of it is suggests that they would allow any any uh, UK flagged ship, the UK trained seafarer, to hold that certification to go out with the UK as well. Um, so that that's what we're being worked on that just uh, just right now. But we were hoping actually to have the first uh, yeah, training courses developed. It was meant to be happening more or less now, but uh, as I realise, all that's come to a very very rapid grinding halt with the the, the, the situation we're in. Um, but we're we're probably ready to go on that uh, to get that up and running in the next uh, as soon as we get uh, clearance to send people uh, 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 south again. We have to send them. One of the whole ironies of this is that the, the only international standard for our, uh, for gas fuel ships is to do with LNG, uh, which so we have to train our crews on LNG, then take them back to Orkney and tell them to forget about everything and train them on hydrogen. So it's, uh, it's quite a quite an interesting process. But anyway, if we have to do it, we have to do it. So that's uh, that's we were we're going. Uh, I think also this could be a business case for the players to offer these uh, training courses to, let's say, Norwegian crew members or, or uh, other around the world. And like and in them, I tell you one thing that uh, last autumn there was a the, the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences offered a new a new uh, subject to the students, and that was hydrogen technology. So that is now being taught in Norway for bachelor students. And that's a good thing. And that is also a plan to make this subject being taught to, to different players around the world if they if they want. And also I almost say, you know, Western Norway will look to Orkney because you have done so many great things on this, you know, this zero emission and, or this uh, renewable energy with hydrogen, wind, tidal power. So, uh, you're doing a great thing and also with social acceptance, which is important. Mm -hmm. uh, you are very clever on that thing, I think. 
Great. Well, that's a good yeah. note to finish up, I think. Conscious yeah, of time, I'll good. leave the questions there. Yeah, I was going to say that too, Jen. That's a very nice. Thanks very much, John. <laughs> uh, back from uh, thoughts from Norway to Orkney. So that's really good. Uh, I would just thank again. I know we can't clap, but we can all thank. There's been lots of uh, <laughs> notes to both speakers uh, 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 in the in the uh, chat. So that's really good. We'll pass these on to them if they can't see it themselves. Uh, we're also going to take the questions. We got through as many questions as we could, but we're, we've put them into a Word document and we're maybe, if, if, if Davy and Trond are happy, we'll circulate it to them if there's any ones that we haven't managed to answer and we'll try and get that back to people if there's any pressing ones, if you don't mind, uh, as, as a follow-up. And then it would be good if anybody had a uh, uh, feedback to feed it back to either Stuart or Jen or myself, just on, on the process. We're hoping through, or if we had a board meeting early tonight, we try and uh, run one or two more of these over the over the sort of shutdown period that we're all in, just to try and keep things moving forward and and uh, keep people's interest. So, I would thank you again. Just a special thank you both to to, to Jen and Stuart for helping me with this tonight. Uh, it was a bit of an experiment, and we hoped it all would go well. And it seems to have gone pretty well technically, anyway. So, so thanks to both of them for for their support as well. So, that's good. We'll call it. A, a day there, guys, and thanks again for everybody for attending. Yep, thanks for listening, and I uh, wish you all well and keep well, please. Yeah, absolutely good sentiment. Thank you, all the best.